Hallelujah. It's a wonderful privilege to be a child of God. And uh, I, Jimmy talks about these things as though they were a sacrifice, but uh, I, I want to tell you, doing things for Jesus is, is never a sacrifice. It's a joy unspeakable and full of glory, and the half has never yet been told. I just want to give a little bit of a commercial before we start. My wife is a prolific writer. She's written three books, The Joy of Raising Daughters. This is the first one, and it tells all about our family and how we grew up. The most amazing a bunch of six daughters uh, who are a blessing all over the world in different ways. And then there's another one which tells more about the mission work and what we're doing and how we, the Lord had blessed us, and it's called From Seed to Harvest, and we see as we've gone on over the years, many years, the, the harvest that we see is multiplied in the lives that we invested in. And there's a number of the guys here that we invested in our lives and time and money and effort and we thank the Lord. And then the last one is a very moving book. It's all about the fact of how we can smile through the deepest trouble. Our brother was sharing about how he went through deep disappointment with God regarding his son who was sick and had troubles. This one is telling about how our daughter who had a bunch of children, four children, and after three and a half years of battling against pancreatic cancer, she passed away and how the Lord helps us to smile through tears. So if you've got anybody who's really going through difficult times and doesn't know how to overcome and feels depressed and feel this is a wonderful book that can help them to see how God is in control. And as we pump into our children and our grandchildren, as we teach them the fundamentals of the kingdom of God, it comes back to us. And so we were sitting around the table a number of uh, years after, about two, three years after our daughter had passed away, and we cared for them and put our mission work mostly on hold because my responsibility is first of all to God and then to my wife and my children and then to the ministry and the ministry doesn't take over the place of my family. I'm going to bless my family. I'm not going to go in on the other side and have a heartache that they never made it because I was too busy trying to win the world. And so we, we were sitting around the table and we were reading out of my daughter's book. And as we read there on the mission, the, the words that had been the faith about healing that had been underlined. And we read it because we are real with our family. We don't, we don't try to sugarcoat everything because the world is not full of sugar. It's full of bitterness and trouble and problems all the way through. And we've got to face them together with our God. We are overcomers. And so as we sat then, we read that the little boy, who was probably then only about eight or seven or eight, he looked up at his granny as he read it and we asked this question and he said, God has a plan. And it was a word to my heart because I must be honest with you, I'd been through wobbles of fear and faith and accusations of all sorts. But God has a plan. And so I want to encourage you, if you want to, the books are available in the bookshop. And I'd like to just speak a few words. I feel quite uh, overwhelmed by the word that we've been having. But I want to say that we need to know how God called us. He didn't call us just to be, uh, uh, as our brother's been teaching us, to be a preacher and have a, a following and have a little, little entourage of people who, who look after us and care for us. No, he called us to be the light and the salt in the world. And so I want to start off by just speaking to you about the lies that the devil tell us. We are full of, this world is full of lies. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus said to them, the people who came to him, he said, you are of your father, the devil, the father of lies. And this world is in the midst of lies, lies everywhere. Oh dear, 
the, the modern uh, uh, secular humanism and postmodernism has taught, taught, taught us that there's no such thing as truth. They've thrown truth aside. They don't want truth. They want to have all their lives because they don't want to let their lives, their life come into line with the word. They so these people in that time are no different to what they are today. When Jesus challenged them about their father they, uh, 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 and spoke of himself, they said in verse 4, uh, 33 of that same chapter, they said, we have never been in bondage to anyone. Well, at that very time, the Romans were ruling over that bunch of Israelites, uh, uh, and they said, no, we've never been in bondage to anyone. The worst thing you can ever do is to lie to yourself. And the world is full of that. The world is full of people who are lying to themselves. And I want to say the world is their own worst enemy because they are constantly lying to themselves. They don't face the truth. But Jesus said, I have come and my life, the truth will set you free. They said, we don't need to be set free. We've never been in bondage. Well, I want to tell you, we need to understand that except for the grace of God, we've all been in bondage. And if we're not careful, we can land up in bondage again. I've come a long way. My dad was a pastor. I was born in the, in the parsonage, and by the grace of God, he helped me to serve him. But I watched a lot of things, and I remember a wonderful provision when we were kids. There was this trouble in the church, and the pastor had collected a lot of money to book. To, he was really an evangelist, and he bought a tent and, uh, and truck and lighting plant, and they went off preaching and establishing churches for that denomination, but the head office said, this is no good. You can't give it another name. He called it Souls for Christ Crusade. So they came and confiscated all his equipment. Finally, he left the church, and he went down the road, and he bought a couple of old houses. And when they started to break out and get the old tin cans at the back, they found all the Krugerrands that you've always wondered where the Krugerrands were lost. They found them in those tins. And they built their church cash with the money. And God blessed him and wonderfully blessed him. And the PPC started, and they were an amazing church within a few a couple of years, they were running more than 100 congregations, and those days to have a church of 500 or so was quite something, and there were a couple of those big churches starting to blossom in the country. But they made a big mistake. Because of this property that had been taken, there was a court case evolved out of it, and I can't remember all the details and who actually fought the case and what it was, but they actually went to the courts of this world. And they opened an opportunity for the devil to hold them back. And today the church is just a shell of what it was. There is a very clear scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, will you go to the world for the solving of your problems? Can't you solve your own problems? Don't you know you're going to have to judge the nations one day? But they were, I mean, there's, you know, when it comes to the story of wearing hats or uh, all these other things that people thought about, well, it's very vague and not absolute, but this is very absolute. But you know, we can easily allow our justification of things to allow a little opportunity. And some years ago, I was up in Johannesburg and uh, with the pastors there in the church, and there was a pastor up in, in Petersburg who was a real problem and he'd he was fighting against this other group and he had the people arrested when they put a fence up on a piece of land and began to have a place where they wanted to have church 
they actually threw them in prison and this man was a terrible guy and he'd done bad things and was living immoral as well but he was now claiming to be a pastor. I spoke to him and tried to persuade him to repent of his behavior but he was abusive. I spoke to the main pastor who was involved with him and said please send someone to minister to him because this man is in desperate trouble. Unfortunately nobody bothered to go. And so I prayed and I spoke to him again once or twice and I said to him, brother, I don't want to do this, but if you're not careful, God will be your judge. Three months later, he fell down dead and his wife very shortly afterwards. And we don't deal with the issues of we live in such, we've compromised so much with the world. The world has, has, has said everything is okay and nothing matters and, and it's all this secular humanism and man is the center of everything. And oh, dear me, I want to warn you and say, I'm not in a legalistic way, but live straight according to what the word of the Lord teaches. And I want to say, as I tested my, in my spirit, as I met up with this pastor, and I found him a man, a humble man, and God has used him in amazing ways. I mean, you know, but I sense in my spirit that spirit of humility, of integrity, and the church has lost its sense of integrity. And the devil has lied to us. The world says that man is basically good. And man is basically rotten to the core. The Bible says the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. The man says, yeah, no, we must look after human rights. But they don't speak about any human responsibilities. And these days, some of the guys who come along want to come into the ministry and they want to know, well, What's in it for them? How much are they going to get paid? I said, you don't do that when you work for the kingdom of God. You don't, you don't want to have to write out this fancy, and I think you should do it anyway, but you don't want to have to write out this fancy clauses of who and what is thing, because we are doing everything as we do it as unto the Lord. But these days we're all looking for us, what we can get out of it. And then the worst thing that we do is we teach people to be victims. And our country is full and across the world they're telling everybody you're a victim of this circumstances and this terrible people that are doing you harm and these ones are saying bad things against you. But I want to say to the, if you're a victim, you'll never be victorious. And we need to teach our people that they mustn't be victims in any way. At the universities in America now, they're creating these safe spaces where you can go to contemplate and nobody will ever say anything ugly against you. And they're teaching us all sorts of foolish things. And we go, the world is going through all these marches where they go marching. Marching against the evil against women. I want to tell you, it ain't doing any help. One iota to anybody, all those marches. We have a school on our farm where we used to have a high school. And this lady came to me and she's not even born again. I was so glad when she spoke about us working with the, with the wolves because she's quite a worldly woman, but she came to me and she said, she works together with the pastor in the, in the area, and she said, we need to build up the school and so on. And so we have a wonderful school now, primary school going on to high school now, but it's a primary school on the farm for the poorest of the poor. It's a private one, but they don't pay very much, very little, and most of them go for nothing. Brother... Uh, is uh, Raymond here, his son just finished uh, primary school and got a full scholarship to go to Selborne College from there. And the Lord is blessing them. But she came to me the other day, she said, Jeff, I went to see her, she said, Jeff, we got a real problem. 
One of my special friends here at Sinsa in the township was murdered by her boyfriend the other day. We've got a real problem. We've got to do something about this situation. She said to me, you know the wonderful thing? I found this group from Johannesburg. I'm flying them down here. They're going to come and help us. And she said, and you'll be happy because it's a Christian organization. She always reminds me of what she seems to land up only working with these sort of people. And uh, she says, they come in, uh, they want us, uh, they're going to help us to mentor the young guys in the township. And she says, and I've chosen these eight guys, and they're not even all born again. One or two of them are, but most of them are not even born again. She says, I've chosen these guys, and they're going to teach them how to be mentors to the boys who don't have fathers, who don't have role models. And so we've got to break out of the circumstances that we're in, and we've got to reach out into this world that we're involved in, and we've got to make a difference. And so the lie of the devil is to Tell us that we're victims, but this name of this group that she started us, we are victorious. And I want to say we are still going to see the victory in every situation. And so I would like to encourage you if there's any way in which you can start a similar sort of thing. You don't have to connect up with these guys in Johannesburg. And they're just a fledging small organization that started. You can do the same in your area, wherever you are. You can get your guys together and you can train them up to be mentors in their town because they haven't got fathers. And so the world is trying to solve the problem with their own things. I'm so glad that our pastor went into the schools there and he said, look, we can help you. And he was just about to get out when they said, well, we'll give you the worst case. And that's what happens often. We were traveling up. We have this high school where the Lord is blessed, and I've shared many times about our high school that we started. But then I said to Pastor Innocent, I said, we need to touch all the other schools in the area. So we drove up the national road towards Transkai, and as we got to the first school, we went in there. We couldn't find the principal. He was in the classroom. He came back a few minutes later looking very fr frustrated, and we told him what we would come to do. And you know what he said to us? He said, you're an answer to prayer. <laughs> and we moved into a classroom. He said, come. We went straight into the classroom and Pastor Innocent had to preach the gospel and we held altar call and laid hands on a number of students because they were having real rebellion there in that classroom. And so let's be the, the light and the salt and make a difference. The government will try to solve problems and they'll always fail. I mean, we have a problem in our country that the little girls are having babies for the little bit of money that they can get. They're so desperately poor. We have so much poverty that this is encouraging the numbers. It's not reducing the numbers of children that have been born. In America, in 1960, there was 20% of the African-American children came from un uh, from single parent homes, 20%. Today it's 75%. Because in 1960, after the, tr the movement for trying to solve the problem with all these marches and demanding this and that and the other, old Lyndon Johnson said, okay, we will support every African American woman who lives in a, a single, as a single parent at home. And so the government has become the fathers of the and supply and the finances for the children. And so 75% of the children now grow up without a father. The government will never solve any problems. And in this country, they're desperately trying to control the churches. They're coming in on every side. They want to come in and control the churches. And you know what happened? In, before Mr. Zuma became president of this country, the South African Council of Churches actually went to him and said, Mr. Zuma, you don't really qualify to be our president because of your lifestyle. 
They weren't accusing him of corruption. They were just looking at his many wives and his other girlfriends and things that he was up to. You know what he did? He got hold of a bunch of church people, this wonderful ecclesia that our pastor has been speaking about, who would sell their soul for anything. And he grabbed hold of them and created another organization to support him. And it's that people that he wants to now make, the government now wants to make the people who will control the church in the future and who will issue licenses for you to preach or not to preach. And so we're in a troublous time in our country. And what is the answer is that the true church of Jesus Christ will stand up and be counted and put into practice what we're hearing and live right and walk straight and not mess around. And there's no body who's willing to stand up and be the, 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 the catalyst or the, or the person or the people who will set the standard and speak out strongly because we don't want to be seen to be condemning anybody. And this world is so full of this that we've got to be politically correct in the church. I'm so glad Jimmy ain't politically correct at all. And I'm not going to be politically correct either. We need to deal with the issues. I know of a case in person. I knew the lady. She married this young man. The two of them were in youth ministry. She married this young man and they went off on honeymoon and he took his boyfriend with. This is in the church I'm talking about. And so after much trauma for this poor woman, the marriage was never consummated. She left him and the church did not deal with the matter and he continued to have youth services with, and our camps with lots of young boys. And nobody ever did anything or spoke anything about, I don't know what he's up to now, but I believe the Lord will have dealt by him by now for a number of years. But there up in Gauteng, they were too poor bang to say anything or do anything about it. I was preaching to my pastors years ago. We used to have every Tuesday at a morning of ministry to them. And the one pastor said to me, as we were reading much from the book of, of uh, uh, Nehemiah, and he said, ah, you like Nehemiah. I said, why do you say that? He said, what you see in Nehemiah when they Sanballat and these other guys came along there and occupied the temple. He climbed into them and he whipped them and he pulled their hair out and chased them out and turfed everything out and warned the people outside the gate. I want to say to you pastors, we need to deal with issues and not just let it flow. We want to live for Jesus. We're not... But if you've compromised and allowed... Uh, a wrong thing in your life, like the PPC, the biggest error they ever made was making that court case, because it came back to them over and, and they persecuted past, poor old Pastor Jimmy with that thing, and God blessed him in spite of it, but they had continual, continual court cases until they finally are no more long, no longer, they don't function at all anymore in any sort of organize, uh, structure. They seem to have lost the plot. The blessing of the, the local churches is fine, but and each one must do his own thing. Because they allowed one little thing. The Bible says, don't give any opportunity to the devil. Don't give any opportunity to the devil. So we look and we think to ourselves, well, I'd love to be as blessed and have the opportunities for pastors got there in, in Mexico. It, it's available to you to be and to do different things. We can't all do the same, but you can be an instrument of, the, of the, the point of the spear, as the name of our Nkonto Wasiswe is about. I want to be the Nkonto Wasiswe of Jesus. 
I want to be the point of the spear. I want to be the one who's going to make a difference. I want to be the man that God is ready to use. And so don't think of yourself less than you are, but ask the Lord to help you to make a difference. We're going to suffer persecution when we do these things. When we stand out strongly against evil, we're going to suffer persecution. But a bit of good old-fashioned persecution didn't do the church any harm. I was listening on YouTube and they spoke. This, this was a secular, a secular program. Some Australian uh, reporters went over to to China and they were investigating. Wherever they went, the security police were following them and they went to go investigate the church. And they were describing it. And I've been to China many times and I've seen my daughter there. And it's amazing what's going on. Back in 1949, when communism took over, there were less than four million Christians, of which three million of them were Catholic, in the country of China. Today, they say over and over again, if it continues as it does, there will be more Christians in China than any other nation in the world. And the devil is throwing all his toys out the cot and fighting. My daughter sent us a message the other day. She said, the local, what was it, the local restaurant got raided and closed down and the, and the, and the, the, the owner got put in prison. It was her way of explaining that the leader of the church that has been, she'd been working with there, local congregation had been raided and he'd been thrown in prison again. I met this man a number of times when we went to China, and uh, he is a man of God, oversees the congregations in his province of about five million people. You sit there and listen to him talk, and you say to yourself, this is, this is like sitting with Peter or Paul. But we've got it too easy. And Jimmy asked a question about when we were having a meeting with the pastors the other day. He said, well, where were the whiteys when they had the meeting down in, uh, in front of the town hall? And I want to say we whiteys are a problem. <laughs> we're too individualistic and we're too our own thing and, we, and we've lost the plot. We cause so much trouble in this world in South Africa, we came along here and we came with our arrogant attitude that we knew better and we were more educated and more developed than the locals, so we started to treat them like slaves and servants and we abused them. And even in this modern day and age, in this wonderful men of God that I've heard talk and they said, well, you know, their church is a mile wide and an inch deep. And with except that my wife was there, I might have got up and clapped the guy. <laughs> because I found that we measure according to our cleverness and our sophistication, but I want to tell you, Jesus ain't sophisticated at all. He's interested in the individual and the little one down the bottom of the line. And so let's be full of the power of God. So... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 says, In all things, don't, don't have any appearance of evil. No appearance of evil. No appearance of evil. Don't try to live as close to the world as you can. Don't try to be conformed and be modern with the things. Yeah, whatever you like, but one of the things that I see, I get sad in my heart, is that we, 
money has become so important. Yes, we can't do the work of the Lord without money and what our pastor was teaching was the absolute truth that we need to walk in the fullness and blessings and God has provided sometimes millions and sometimes a zilch for us. And sometimes I think we need to understand that. Paul said, I've learned in all things to be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. But I've seen some guys and they advertise on the TV and they show uh, their, their meetings and they collect lots of money and they live in a house of over a 2,000 square meter floor space. I mean, they live in like rock and roll stars. And I say to myself, I, I, I don't understand it. It's causing a person, person who live in this almost immoral lifestyle of finances in the name of the Lord. I want to say, if you're in a ministry, you live at approximately the level of the, of the successful members of your congregation. But don't live 10, 20 times higher than them. Live at approximately the level of the successful men in your... You're a successful man in God. You don't need to live in poverty. I chose because I worked amongst African folk all the years not to live in the fancy suburbs of my town. And by the grace of God, oh Raymond, who helped me, we built a little house outside the sunrise on sea and God blessed us. And we don't live in poverty. But money doesn't do anything. You can only sleep in one bed and wear one pair of shoes at a time. And and you only have one wife and you better keep it that way. <laughs> and so I'm nearly finished now because it's nearly lunchtime and I feel... One of the things my dad taught me when, when we were young was there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, he that restrain us will restrain until he be taken out. And he said, we who are the church of Jesus Christ, the, the kingdom of God in this earth, we keep in the cap on this world. But we ain't been doing a very good job of it. We haven't been doing a good job of it. We haven't been constraining things because we've been doing it inside our four walls, as our pastor's been explaining. We need to get out there into the marketplace. We need to be constraining more and more because the day will come when the kingdom of God, when the rapture takes place and all of us go floating off to heaven, all hell is going to break loose in this earth. And they'll be sorry when we're gone, but then it'll be a bit too late for them. And so we need to keep on constraining we need to keep on constraining. And I close off with this last verse, and it's John chapter 8, 17, verse 18. I thought it was. Let me just check. I wrote down there, and now I'm not sure that I got the right. Put glasses on. Yes, 17 verse 18. As, I, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. This is the prayer that Jesus prayed. If you want to get a good book, get the book by Michael Cassidy on the prayer Jesus prayed. Jesus sent us into this world to make a difference. And he wants to put in your minds all sorts of wonderful plans by his spirit. The thing that caught me of our pastor's teaching was, we've got to see the what, and he will show us the how. Remember that. It's a very fundamental thing. He, he, we'll see the what. There's a problem here. God will show us the how. He will give us innovative Ideas so that we can infiltrate the world and get in there and make a difference. Jesus was praying to his father and he's praying for his, his church and he says, now, 
As you sent me, I've sent them. I want to be that sent one. The politicians talk to Mamina, send me. Huh? And they don't even know what they mean. They want to be sent in plushness and in wonderful and try and solve all the problems with the humanistic idea, but we're going to be, we're sent by God. We've been given a, and it's yours to take. And so the persecution will come, but we don't even worry about it. I was in China and I was sitting there in my daughter's house and this lady came to visit. She wasn't a pastor or anything, just one of the leading ladies in the church and she could speak quite good English. And she said to me, oh, but we don't, I said to you, don't ask us to pray for a change of government. She says, no, we don't worry about that. In fact, the government help us. And I said, how on earth does this government help you? He says, well, you see, when we gather together and we win some souls in our house, we've got about 20 or 30, and it gets to be about 30 or 40, and we still, we live in these little tenement buildings upstairs in the sixth floor or whatever, and we sing and we praise the Lord, and after a while, somebody goes and shops us to the cops. So the cops come along, she didn't use these terms, but she, she says the police come along and arrest the leaders, and so we split up into four or five groups and we start again, and then we multiply. He says, because we, we get very complacent when we've got 30 or 40 people in our little group there. It, we get very complacent about it. So I'm praying one day the Lord will start sending the cops to break us up. <laughs> so that we can touch more lives. And win the kingdom for Jesus. <laughs> and I want to tell you, when you walk with the Lord, he, he, he pours out his blessing upon your life. And I'm done now. I just want to say this last thing. And that is, he shares his glory with his church, with his sent one. He shares his glory. He prayed there and he said, Lord, at the beginning of the prayer, he says, Lord, give me the glory that we had together in heaven. And he didn't get that glory complete until he'd finished the task of dying and paying the price. But then he's been exalted and given a place above all at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. He's glorified in heaven, and we glorify him continually in our meetings. But then he continues and he prays for his disciples, those there, and then he prays for those who will be taught by him, by them, and who will come to know him. That means he's praying for you and I. And he says, I will give them my glory. And so, I want you to stand in the presence of the king so that he can give you some of his glory right now so that it can shine out of your life when you go from here. So that it can make a difference when you walk into a room, when the glory of the Lord is around about you, when that anointing is upon your life, it will break the powers that are in that place. And so in the name of Jesus, I let that prayer that Jesus prayed, Lord, as they come as one in unity, for that is our requirement, that we will be one in unity, and I sense a spirit of unity in this place, a blessing of unity. I pray, God, that the glory of God will shine out from your children, and that people will say, oh, but this man has been with Jesus. This man has shown the nature and the character of the Son of God and has changed the circumstances in their lives, in their homes, in their churches, in their towns, in their schools, wherever they go, that they will go with the power of God and see the glory of God manifest in a mighty way. Just take them in your loving arms like a father to a little child. And he says to you as he takes you in his arm, he says, don't worry. 
I've put a seed in you, it's my seed, it will bring forth fruit. That which God has started will complete. I've put within you a, this eternal seed of God. When you healed it to me, I put that seed in there and it's an eternal seed and it will grow to glorify God. And when we receive the glory of God, all that we do is we pass it on to Jesus. Hallelujah. And so he takes us in his arms like a father. I've got six little girls and they loved them so much, especially when they were cute little things and took them in their arms. And I didn't think about how long they still got to grow to become full. But today they're wonderful young women leading their families and being a blessing. So God says to you, you're growing in me, but I'm, that seed that you've put in there, that I put in there will come and bring forth fruit to the glory of the Son of God.